We want to bring in our political team. Robert Costa is our chief election and campaign correspondent. Major Garrett is our chief Washington correspondent. Nicole Killian is our congressional correspondent. Ed O'Keefe is our senior White House and political correspondent. Thank you all for being here in your holiday best. It's great to be here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 2023, Nicole, kept you very busy. You had a new Speaker of the House, this record number of retirements, resignations, departures. Um, and now we start the new year potentially on the cusp of another government shutdown. Will they be able to legislate in 2024? Well, I think that's the million dollar question. You know, one would hope, but uh, the reality is it's going to be a very heavy lift for Congress in the new year, not only trying to fund the government, but also dealing with this unresolved issue of the national security supplemental, whether they can get an agreement on the border. You know, they have 10 legislative days before that first government funding deadline. And, and the issues of very real world uh, implications. I mean, Ed, it, some of these border figures are pretty staggering. 10,000 people per day at a time crossing. Does the president need to get directly involved to close this deal, or is it too politically complicated for him to do so? I think they're trying to keep him from having to engage in the particulars and trying to bring him in towards the end. The fact that in the closing days of the year, it was the Homeland Security Secretary and the Chief of Staff doing much of the negotiating, that was a signal that they were working through the actual details and the mechanics of what it would mean at the Department of Homeland Security and other agencies to get certain changes made and whether the lawyers were okay with it. For the first time in decades. Exactly. And, and the politics of it, though, are so much more difficult for the president. He's going to problems first with Democrats, especially progressives who don't want to see any semblance of Trump-era immigration policy reenacted, but perhaps more importantly, on the margins, uh, Latino lawmakers who say you're now going after a values proposition with a key block of voters that need to support you if you expect to win again. Uh, there was also concerns that they just weren't consulted at all in the beginning. But there's a political incentive for him to close a deal here, Major. If he can. And what is important about this immigration conversation, Margaret, it's not like the ones we've gone through for the last 10 years where we're talking about comprehensive, meaning the right gets something and the left gets something. The contours of this current debate are all on what Republicans want and are demanding on a policy side, not even just about money. And that is a seismic shift. And it is something that the White House has come to terms with, but hasn't found a legislative solution or a political way of talking about it. Mm. And if there's been one issue for this White House that has been, I think, a blind spot, it has been immigration. And now all of that political upheaval is coming home to the White House. And they're on the cusp of, as Ed indicated, major concessions that will bring policy very close, if not identical, to Trump policy. When you talk to senators uh, about what this will look like, what do we know? We don't know a lot. We do know, for instance, that, uh, you know, the White House has put on the table a willingness to accept limits on asylum, expand detention and deportation efforts. But, you know, there's also this big sticking point of parole, which the Biden administration has been using particularly to help, for instance, Afghan evacuees, Ukrainians who are displaced by the Russian war. And Republicans feel that authority is being abused. So that really has kind of slowed down mm -hmm. these negotiations. President Zelensky said that it was a issue of morale, not just money, mm -hmm. that it was a statement uh, that the United States was backing away potentially from Ukraine, even if that wasn't the intention. Um, what are you hearing from your sources on Capitol Hill? Because against the backdrop of all these really important issues, we now also have some pretty tricky politics in the House that a new speaker would have to navigate if they get that deal in the Senate. It's beyond almost something that's tricky politically. It's foundationally now complicated for President Biden as he interacts with the Republican Party leadership. Because on one hand, he has a willing partner in Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell, who looks at Ukraine as a traditional Republican on foreign policy, believes the United States has a role in Western Europe, encountering Russian influence in the region. At the same time, President Biden's also dealing with this new Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, who comes from the Trump wing of the party, and that Trump wing is now fueled by this sense of nationalism, sometimes incoherent, but very certain in its direction in not wanting to give more aid to U.S. allies, to NATO countries, and in this case also to Ukraine. And that's something that's going to confront President Biden for the rest of his presidency, whether it's till the end of this term or through a second term. But part of this 
it's just the mechanics, right, of what does Speaker Johnson want to do? Who does he want to be? He's from this more conservative element of the party, the Freedom Caucus. What are the choices he want to, wants to make if he also could be ousted like and, Kevin and what McCarthy? choices can he make right. based on a very narrow majority, more narrow than it was when he became Speaker by two seats? And what will the caucus, or the conference rather, that used a tool to oust the previous Speaker because he cut a deal with Democrats to keep the government open. What if Mike Johnson is in a position where to keep the government open, my goodness, he has to cut a deal with Democrats. <laughs> How do you look he at that will, existential right? issue? I mean, right. well, we did see that to a certain extent when they passed this laddered or two-tiered CR, right? Actually, more Democrats voted for it. The short-term funding deal that expires January. Exactly. January. And so you know, it's possible that may have to happen again. Now, Speaker Johnson has made clear that he does not want to do any more short-term fixes. And so if they can't figure out this appropriations process, then both Republicans and Democrats may have to accept across-the-board cuts, which neither side wants to do. But I think, you know, if you look at Speaker Johnson's leadership, he also has shown times where he's been able to wrangle Republicans together, most notably with the impeachment inquiry vote, where Republicans voted unanimously for it. Mm -hmm. So it is a very uh, narrow tightrope that the speaker has to walk, but ultimately I think he showed that he can tow both lines when necessary, so we'll just have to see how he plays things come the new year. To the campaign trail, um, Bob Costa, I know you've been out there a fair amount. What are you taking away from what people across the country are hearing? They've already written off Washington as broken a long time ago, right? Mm -hmm. But what are they focused on and concerned about? Well, Republican voters are looking to see if former President Trump is going to remain in this front-running position through the Iowa caucuses and through the New Hampshire primary. It's evident based on CBS News' latest polling and my conversations with New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu and others in that state that Nikki Haley is getting a foothold in New Hampshire. The question is, in the coming weeks, can she move from around 25 to 30 percent of support among Republicans in New Hampshire to 45 to 50 to 50 plus? and really make New Hampshire a place where she gets a bounce into her home state of South Carolina and then later into Super Tuesday. Talking to sources on Wall Street, there's likely going to be a migration of cash toward Haley in the coming weeks to help her survive late into the race. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, when I'm talking to Republican voters, they still have the same grievances in many cases that Trump has when it comes to the percep perception of a political establishment, a legal establishment they believe is aligned against the Republican Party. And those grievances are fueling Trump's support at this time, even as he faces so many other issues. It's interesting that that sense of grievance you're saying is what's resonating above kitchen table issues, above national security issues. What is that coming from? It comes from how so many voters channel Trump's own anger over the 2020 elections. Some share his false claims that he won the election in 2020. He did not. And they believe he deserves a second shot. And it's so unusual to have a former president running for the nomination again. I mean, I right. can't even imagine Jimmy Carter running in 1984, or George H.W. Bush running in 1996. It's historically almost inconceivable, but it's happening. And Republican voters, for the most part, are looking at him. But I have detected, Margaret, the support for Trump in some places, especially in New Hampshire, noticeably soft. They like Trump, but they're not totally committed to voting for him at this late juncture. There is a component of Trump's message that does address the other two things. I'm not going to get you in wars. We didn't have any wars when I was president. That's on the national security isolationist uh, or nationalist approach, mm -hmm. and better off with Trump. They just rolled that campaign slogan out right. recently, meaning economically, you were happier, more secure, felt better when I was there. So he is trying to address that, but the grievance is the thing that is the rocket fuel and has solidified him all through the long summer of indictments. So, Ed, tell me what the president's message for his reelection is. I was speaking to someone at the White House recently who told me the two issues of most concern to him are gas prices and the numbers at the border leading up to the election. So it's an economic and sort of public safety government management argument, right, is, is what they've been trying to make, that if you look at the economic indicators, inflation is going down, unemployment is staying low, consumer confidence is up, that's a good thing. Border security, crime are, are two issues that they certainly worry about because they know on the margins, independent voters all over the country, the Republicans that might be compelled to vote for him could be dissuaded if they see those things not necessarily handled. He also knows he has to deal with immigration because it is such a base mm -hmm. issue of concern, not only uh, an issue for independent voters. They fully expect it will be Trump. They fully expect to be able to throw up the contrast and say, 
The economy is in better shape. The pandemic's over. We're dealing with the global challenges that have occurred. He would do a worse job of it. And you should stick with this guy. And abortion. And, and abortion. democracy. That's what they're hoping. Creates they, will be, they will be there. Those are Acts second and third. And Acts two and three. Harris is going to be out front on abortion rights, based on my reporting. Yeah. Uh, right. So can she motivate those young voters that they need to actually be excited? There is evidence that she can. Uh, they, they came out of this college tour she did this fall quite impressed and pleased with the reaction. It's part of why there's now this plan for a college tour focused on abortion services. Uh, mostly in battleground states to draw attention to it. But absolutely, they saw something there that said she can bring back black voters, she can bring back women, she can bring back younger voters, and serve as that sort of partisan cudgel that a running mate often does. And that coalition is going to be key for Biden if he's looking to be reelected in terms of young voters and voters of color in particular. But, you know, some of that support has softened. Mm -hmm. And so while the Biden campaign argues, well, people just still need to hear our message. We need to get our message out more. People need to understand what we've done and what we've accomplished. Part of that is using the vice president, I think, to convey that message. But it is one that they are going to have to hammer home because there are many voters saying, we may just sit this one out. Out. We don't necessarily like Trump, and we're not going to vote for him, but we may not vote for Biden. And I think that's going to be a big hurdle for the Biden campaign as they move forward into 24. I, I want to make sure that I ask you, because I know you have spent a lot of time talking mm -hmm. to election officials. We right. heard this incredible warning from Microsoft about foreign interference, mm -hmm. but domestically, sure. there's concern about security. Foreign interference is uh, going to be a concern perpetually, and it is. We all love campaigns. For most of my political coverage career, I took the process by which we run elections for granted, overlooking the hundreds of thousands of Americans who do this work either as an election administrators, as poll observers, or poll workers. I have a deeper appreciation for them now than ever before after 2020. They're stressed. Many of them are retiring or just quitting mm -hmm. under that stress. That is a problem for institutional knowledge in a lot of swing states. That is something that people in this space who watch election administration very closely are worried about. They're under-resourced. Our elections are decentralized. There's no federal management of elections. We have a lot of elections. They're costly, they're local, and they're complex. Those are weaknesses and strengths. We do it pretty well, but this particular part of America that does this heroic work, oftentimes unnoticed, is under tremendous scrutiny, stress, anxiety, and some are leaving, and that does create a gap of knowledge, a gap of experience that may not help us through 2024. It's an open question, but there are those in this space who are nervous about it, very much so. I'm sure they are. Um, and very real threats, as we saw in the last election. Threats that uh, manifest themselves in lots of different ways, but if you're an election worker, it doesn't matter if it's a text message or if it's a phone call that's left on a voicemail in the office, you feel threatened. Right. They walk to their cars wondering, should they be looking over, they actually are looking over their shoulders. And that's not a space we want our fellow Americans, our neighbors, our friends to be in when they're doing this work of helping us cast, count, and certify our votes. And it is incredible. I mean, to your point about the brain drain, how I remember talking to the Arizona Secretary of State about this. All of what happened in the last four or five years is coinciding with a lot of people just aging out. Mm -hmm. So it's not even that they're quitting because they're intimidated. They're quitting because it's time Time to retire. Time to not do this anymore and pass it off to the next and generation. New generation. And the concern is that next generation is going to be wearing blue or red visors right. and, and sunglasses while they're counting the votes.